So, so I have for you guys a call to action. I, I think that this is a place where we've dropped the ball. We, and I say collectively, as, as, as Christians, we're barreling down on a world that is becoming the kind of place we don't want to live in. The kind of place we don't want to live in. And, uh, and we don't seem to sufficiently care. The other day, I uh, was uh, at a concert in the Netherlands. Dutch popular musician, and I bump into one of my ex libri guests, a wonderful young lady, vibrant, uh, gifted physician. She's just uh, yeah, taken over her own practice, uh, is now two years down the line, and knowing that I was going to be talking on euthanasia, I, I asked her, so uh, are you confronted with this in your, uh, in your practice at all? Foyer, foyer of the, uh, of the concert bursts out crying, wept, weeps bitterly, and then goes to explain that she feels so desperately alone. She comes out of a, a free reformed uh, household, you know. Uh, but what she said to me, the only person, I'm quoting her verbatim, I'm not thinking this in, the only person that has supported me in my non-willingness to, to, to do euthanasias, that's not willing to do, uh, the only person who supports me is my pharmacist, the one who you know, provides the medicines for my practice. He's, he said, you know, keep up the good work. Everybody else looks at me as though I'm less moral than the rest. Um, this is somebody who is inside the church, somebody who is not feeling supported in her, in her profession, uh, making the hard decision to, to say, this is something I don't want to do. In the Netherlands, 86% of all physicians are willing to do euthanasias. That leaves only 14% who have the courage to say no. The battle for the hearts and minds is really where it's at. In the Netherlands, we've gone the full legalization route and we're incrementally still shifting. Without uh, a renewed, let's say, change of what we think as a culture, there's going to be no peel back of our laws. No amount of political strategizing is going to make any changes in the Dutch context. And I wager to say that if the, the countries that have been the crowbar to break this issue open, the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, Switzerland, if in those contexts the attitudes are not repealed, are changed at the hearts and minds level, this thing is incrementally going to grow and we will ultimately lose the battle in the end. And so uh, when I'm thinking about how we go about that, I'm not just thinking about holding back laws. And you see in the Netherlands, holding back laws doesn't help anymore because we already have them. I, I'm talking about attitudes that would need to change sufficiently that we're aware we need to do a better job of protecting life and, and to re-legislate protection. Now to get there, one needs a clear position when you are too contorted and nuanced, you end up having no position at all. So one needs a clear position on, on being opposed to killing and on the awareness that it is a dangerous route. And I use those, those two words. In, in our talking about this, killing and dangerous, these are our friends because they are true. These are not gimmicks. We're talking about killing not about life shortening, not about uh, relieving pain, etc. We're talking about killing, and we need to stay clear about what the issue is. We're talking about <laughs> killing, and the truth is that if we open the door to killing, that is dangerous in all sorts of areas. And, and my, my own personal experience with what happened in my family uh, is, a, is a story that, that, that argues this point. And it, it's a single issue that is worth tackling. That means... <coughs> Um, if one wants to, to uh, get people to understand the, the gravity of this issue, we need to be willing to, uh, to say uh, euthanasia is the kind of cause that's worth, worth spending a lot of my life's energy on. Uh, there need to be some people doing this. I was just uh, having the privilege to speak in Australia and New Zealand last week. And um, uh, in New Zealand... Uh, there was a, a, a lovely young lady, Renee Hubert, who's, who's heading up uh, Euthanasia Free New Zealand. And um, she's doing it without yet having gotten 
the financing for her own life. You know, she's basically living out of the trunk of her car, house sitting for people at the moment, uh, but with a passion. And it, it's important in New Zealand because the court cases are happening now. The, the attitudes are busy changing now. The laws are being drafted. She's a, she's a godsend to that society at the moment, uh, doing a great work, spearheading a movement. But it takes sacrifice uh, to, to, to do something uh, worth doing. Okay. Uh, 2013, here uh, in Europe, we uh, uh, started a coalition called the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition. It's a one-issue coalition, uh, and I think it's a good idea to, to, to take it seriously. And it allows for co-belligerence. This is not just a Christian thing. This is something for everybody who's concerned about the safety of society. And um, in all sorts of different ways, we might not agree with people on other things, but people who are, are uh, at a disadvantage vulnerable groups, uh, societies for the aged, uh, handicapped societies, etc. They all have reason to be very concerned about the developments in Europe, and uh, we need to be willing to, to work together with them. This term co-belligerence is something that uh, my former, uh, let's say, before I was around colleague, uh, Francis Schaeffer, who started Libri, he, uh, he used this, this term when it came to the ethical issues uh, in, um, in the political arena, and I think that, um, that he was right. This theme is part of the Libri heritage, uh, in the sense that Francis Schaeffer wrote a book, what ha Whatever Happened to the Human Race. He did also some uh, film uh, uh, episodes uh, on the topic. It is, it's part of our apologetic. That means that when a society loses sight of the spiritual dimension, loses sight of God, ultimately, our creator, we end up becoming materialistic, which leads to a hedonistic ethic, which leads to a loss of understanding what the intrinsic value of life is. It's a, it's a logical consequence. And so it's a topic which I think is worth talking about as a demonstration of what happens when, uh, when one, uh, one loses sight of God. Compassion, meaning, and pain. This debate, more than any other, is shrouded and wrapped in the language of compassion. So don't think that we're entering into a field of heartlessness that would be way too easy. The motives are couched primarily in the language and vernacular of compassion. This makes it very complicated for Christians to speak into this debate because we're so used to speaking with the language and the vernacular of compassion. You need to realize this coming in. You see, the, uh, the Latin word behind compassion is compatio, patio, patio, passus sum. Um, it's a Latin word which means intensity and has come to mean uh, suffering. The passion of the Christ would be uh, the ultimate. Is that a meaningless event? I don't need to ask the question. The height of meaning in all history was accompanied by intense pain. Meaning and suffering are not each other's enemies. Our society seems to think that if there is suffering, there must not be meaning. Pain is not worth having. Non-pain, fun, joy, that's worth having. That's, that's the ethic of our time. Compatio, com means together with. Compassion is not to remove the other's suffering. It is to enter into, together with, the other person to enter into their suffering, to stand beside them. Now, I put a little picture here of somebody, you know, doing some fitness training. All of us know when we are at the gym that the one who doesn't allow for a little bit of pain is never going to have a sleek body. No pain, no gain, we say flippantly, but it's true. We're willing to take, you know, getting red in the face when we're in the gym. But all of a sudden, when it comes to the life issues, we seem to forget that meaning outclasses pain. I quote 1 Peter 3, verse 14. Now, most of you will know 1 Peter 3, verse 15, especially attending a conference like this. That's the Apologia text, uh, where we are called to give the reasons for the hope that is within us. That's 1 Peter 3, verse 15. The verse that precedes it is very dear to me. It's this one. But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. It's a present continuous text, a tense, if you look in the Greek. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. 
profound advice. Peter was speaking here to the, the group of Christians who were suffering most. Read your New Testament. One Peter is the letter of suffering. These were people who were f physically suffering for their faith. And, and he reminds them that pain doesn't have the last word. Even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Blessing and suffering can coexist. I repeat, blessing and suffering can coexist. That means you can be in a difficult time of suffering at the end of life and still have a meaning-filled existence. This is what we believe. Why? Because we're not materialists. Because the spiritual dimension really matters to us. Even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Blessing and suffering can coexist. And the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ would argue the case. With humans, yeah, I, I borrowed the term weight of glory from C.S. Lewis. I don't use it like he does. Um, but, but I want to make a point with it. Um, the contemporary ethic is, is a specific case of materialism. But the truth is that, that human beings carry something more. A student at our lunch table the other day asked me, so Hank, you know, we put animals out of their misery when, they, when they're suffering. You know, why don't we do that for humans? We treat humans less well than we treat animals. Sounds sort of rational, but profoundly misguided. Why? Because human beings carry something which is distinctly human, which animals don't. And it has to do with this layer of the spiritual, the, the, the layer in which meaning is, is had and understood. You see, all of us live our lives with a sense of the impact of our deeds into the, the future. Have you ever seen an, in the animal kingdom a monument to, to a creature? No. Human beings have monuments to people from 2,000 years ago. We are aware that people will remember us, either for good or for bad, on the basis of what we do. This is the weight of glory. You see, we carry with us much more than just our need for food in the now, our animal instincts. We carry with us the weight of glory. That means our lives are lived with an understanding that meaning surpasses the moment. Meaning outclasses pain. No longer is compassion in our culture enduring with, you know, being with somebody in, the, in, in their intense, in, intensity, but it has become providing freedom, the freedom to avoid, to avoid with an emphasis on what is being called dignity, huh? to give somebody a, a, the opportunity to avoid the, the undignified part of of the last phase of life so that they can have a dignified uh, you know, death. But actually, it's, it's autonomy that, um, that we're talking about. We're not talking about dignity, per se. I'll be ending with a definition of what I think the dignity is. But it's, it's my conviction that our, our culture is confusing autonomy. That means being a law unto yourself, being able to, to define for yourself. See, the truth is, that's not a very loving mode of being human. We are tied, in our best moments, to all those ripples, circles around us of people whose lives we impact with our decisions. Autonomy is not nearly as beautiful as post-French Revolution Western society thinks it is. And we have the gale force wind of culture against us. Liberty and autonomy are maybe the most lasting values uh, left from the, the French uh, Revolution. It's, it's all the rage in, in movies. 21st, 20th, 21st century, the new chic is euthanasia and assisted suicide uh, movies. All from the point of view of non-disabled white people who, who come to the same conclusion. Uh, namely, it's a great idea to, to put people out of their misery. Um, if you look at the values of the French Revolution, you have liberté, that's freedom, fraternity, and egalité. Of those three, the only one that's still quite intact is liberté. Fraternity, you know, brotherhood, solidarity, being willing to take a salary cut so that your, your neighbor uh, can have an equal amount. 
in the Western world, our capitalism uh, leaves, leaves little space for, for robust uh, fraternity. Um, egalité, equality, really, we have the largest gap between wealthy and poor of any moment ever in history, measured by the multiple of times that the wealthy have versus the, the poor. If you look at the graphs over the 20th century, you see the distance, the poverty gap being here at the beginning of the century. Exponential growth. Liberty, that's the last, the last standing French Revolution value. Only it has become liberty for me, loose from fraternity, loose from, from what it does to others. When the immaterial fades and the material becomes all-defining, the definition of what it is to be compassionate shifts. Physical pain avoidance becomes dominant over the purpose, meaning, and the value of what is represented. And this is, this is the shifting field of meanings that we've, we've, we've come to be accustomed with, with, with post-modernity. It's not a new thing that, that meanings shift, but we need to watch out. The language of compassion is deeply tricky, and you need to do hard work in redefining what it means to be compassionate. Compassion in our society seems to have become, please let me help you out of my misery. Okay, I'm going to spend a few minutes now diving into the practical situation on the ground in the Netherlands. And I, I want this to be something that we can draw some insights from for each of you in your various countries. It's a, it's a big part of what we're, we're doing today. So I'm going to be looking at, at uh, mortality rates in the Netherlands and how they've been impacted by our euthanasia decisions. And I'm going to look at what's happening in the realm of palliative care. That means uh, how we go about dealing with people's pain and how that has changed because of our legalizing euthanasia. And this is something which is a, a deep concern to me. It's, it's one of those knock forward effects, uh, which is exactly opposite in terms of where it's gone, to what we expected. We thought, and I say we collectively in the Netherlands, I don't necessarily include myself in the first person, we thought as a society that if we legalized what was already happening anyway, that this was the vocabulary, then we would be able to tie it down, build in protections and safeguards, and we would stop backdoor euthanasia. We would limit backdoor euthanasia. Profoundly misguided, exactly the opposite has happened, and the figures don't lie on this, on this score. I'm going to share with you some, some uh, graphs. I, I do this because, because visuals help us to, to see, let's say, through the forest of, of data. This is World Health Organization mortality database uh, data that we're looking at. One can find it at a Dutch website called nationalkompas.nl. These days, it, it um, bumps you through to a, to a public health uh, a site. This is uh, 1970. That's 2010. And uh, this is the, the number of deaths per 100,000 men. Uh, the green line is the EU15 median. So that's the sort of aggregated data of mortality rates for the 15 wealthiest nations in Europe, the ones that the Netherlands should compare itself with most. And what you see on the whole is that between 1970 and 2010, there's a big good news show in the medical uh, sector uh, in, uh, in Europe. That means people are living longer and so mortality statistics drop. Less people die per year per 100,000 because people are living longer. They're living longer because of what's happened in our diet and in our medical system. Now, I've added two countries just for comparison, Italy and France, and you see that their lines with the normal fluctuations, basically parallel the EU 15 line. And then I've put in the Netherlands line. And what you see is that the Netherlands is one of the best boys in class in 1970. We actually have, for 1970, a very low mortality rate. Good medical system, great GP system, where everybody has their own private GP, well, you know, sort of deep penetration in terms of medical care in the population. And we're doing great. And then somewhere in the early 80s, something happens in the Netherlands. Things start to change, and you see the Dutch line goes out of whack with what's happening in the countries around it. And you see our line slowly meandering through the other lines and ending up above the EU 15 median. I find this very compelling. 
when you look at it. Now, of course, I'm not going to try and simplify cause and effect. I don't know all the causes, and it would take a massive amount of research to, to, to get very clear cause and effect patterns. But one thing is for sure, and that's that something is happening in the Netherlands which is different from all the nations around it. And if we, uh, just uh, to, to let you see the, the female graph, uh, here you see France had a, a similar mortality rate with its women as the Netherlands did. And France continues to parallel the EU15 development, while the Netherlands goes out of whack here. Uh, in 1984, we could use PEG as, a, as an important date, and then we end up way above the EU15, and significantly more above the EU15 than others. It's making, uh, let's say, uh, assisted suicide and euthanasia available to people is something that is, on average, um, received more by women than by men. It's a woman-unfriendly route to go. Why? Because men are inclined to, in a violent way, take their lives if they really want to, while women think about the mess they leave behind for their, their next of kin. And so if you give women a clean route of exit, they are likely to use it slightly more often than men would. And we see this in the figures of assisted suicide in, um, in uh, the United States, for example, Montana, that... Uh, that has uh, allowed for, or Oregon is it? Sorry, sorry, Oregon, that has allowed for it. And um, there, 70% uh, of the cases of assisted suicide have been, been of women, only 30% of men. Um, just the, the way this graph, uh, when you go to that website these days, they only start in 1985. I put two different countries in here. Um, the EU15 is red this time. The Dutch one is the uh, yellow line. Here you see this yellow line going through. And the other two are the UK and Germany. Um, just so that also compared to the UK and Germany, you see us coming out from left field. And yes, we had a very good situation, and now we're close to the average. And so everybody says, oh, well, you know, we're, we're sort of OK. But something has changed in the Netherlands. Now, a short history. Um, the first court cases happened in the early 70s. 1973. The Gertrude Postma case, Truus Postma, she's sometimes called, um, uh, was, was a, a real hinge point. And what we see here is that, that the domino stones start to fall with court cases. So if you want to oppose euthanasia in your society, you have to work at the level of looking at what's happening in the courts. What happens in the courts precedes what happens in the laws. This is, this is true for nearly all the situations in which euthanasia has become commonplace, is that it started with court cases. Jurisprudence gets formed. Now, what happened in 73? She killed her mother with a, a morphine overdose. And um, when it went to court, she got a slap on the, on the wrist, one week suspended sentence. And um, the courts formulated some criteria for how it should have happened i.e. due procedure criteria. This was in the arrest, in, in, the, in the formulations. And this was a sort of, yeah, uh, indirect way of the courts to give a signal to physicians, if you do it this way, it's sort of okay. And so physicians, there was an avid debate throughout the 70s, physicians started to use the space more and more. By 1984, we get to the point where it's gotten to be quite commonplace. That's that, that, that tipping point that you see in the Dutch, Dutch statistics. 1984, you have a, a variety of court cases taking place, and all of this culminates in 1986 with the KNMG uh, having a, a guideline. That's the, the KNMG is the Royal Dutch Medical so Association. They formulate a guideline for due procedure when doing a euthanasia. And they have the implicit agreement of the Justice Department. So euthanasia is formally illegal in the Netherlands. Thou shalt not kill. And yet informally, there's a deal. There's an understanding that it's okay within certain parameters. And that becomes formal, you know, that's protocolized in the 1980s. And, and what we see is that the big change in terms of the statistics of dying takes place then. So this is, this is the moment when it happens, 1986. That's 15 years before we legalized formally. We lost the battle there, 1986, with 
all the dire consequences, people started to die. People were getting killed. People were getting killed without consent. You know, that's a, a sort of a rough statement to make. The Dutch don't like to hear it, but their own studies indicate that there were lots of people being killed without consent. We have the, our due procedure criteria. You can look them up. They're easily available uh, uh, online. From this point on, from 1984 onwards, uh, euthanasia becomes something that's protocolized and, uh, you know, it's, it's narrowed down uh, the, the scope of what euthanasia is. Uh, to, uh, to those things that meet these criteria. And a bunch of things are not included under euthanasia anymore, um, which I think is correct. Ceasing treatment. There's no you know, treatment imperative. We're a technologized society that often over-treats. We pour our treatments over patients of whom there's no indication that our treatment might actually be able to heal them. We need to ask in the, in the latter years, how much of the procedures that we actually can pour out over somebody, we should. People have the right to say, no, I don't, I don't think it's, it's time for me to take another course of chemotherapy for this, for this cancer. You know, we're, we're living in a technological imperative where we try to achieve eternal life. History continued. In 1991, the Dutch government started to do uh, large-scale um, data collection and, um, and to public, uh, publish these, these government-run studies so that we could see what, what all was happening. And uh, in 1991, um, there were about uh, three and a half thousand um, euthanasias or assisted suicides. And if you look at the, the figures back then, um, it's interesting that 1,040 of those were administered without patient's consent. This is what physicians are filling in on questionnaires themselves. And if you look more specifically at that data, 410 of those people were incompetent. That means that they were in such a state that they couldn't have given informed consent anymore. But more importantly, the rest were competent. And yet the physician made a decision to put somebody out of their misery without getting their explicit consent. It shows you how rapidly, this is long before we've legalized, this is already happening in this kind of, of, of amounts. Uh, similar results were found in 1996. And this figure of 9.1% of all deaths, yeah, physician-induced is maybe too strong, but they, they were aware in the studies that the way morphine was being used in pain treatment may have been indicative or life-shortening in enough cases that, that about 9% of all annual deaths may have been shortened lives because of physician uh, input. Um, so we have these government-run uh, studies. Agnes van der Heide at the Erasmus, Brechi Onuteka Philipson, those are people who have been leading uh, the group uh, in various years, um, doing good work. We Dutchies like to get our data right so that the whole world can see. Uh, and I think we do the world a service by letting them see where these things go. Look at the absolute numbers. In 2001, we formally legalized. That's when it went to parliament and got a majority saying, yay, we want this. And that was a moment when, in politics, sometimes the dominoes fall in certain, a certain way. We didn't have any Christian Democrats in the ruling coalition at the moment. We had the, what we call the Purple Coalition, you know, the capitalists and the, uh, and the socialists uh, together, uh, but no Christian Democrats. Uh, so the middle ground was absent in that coalition. And then uh, the D66, the Sester, that provided the Minister uh, of Health, uh, was, was pushing it. There was a more sort of secular democratic movement in the Netherlands. Anyway, in the first four years, the actual, the formal euthanasia numbers actually dropped. And everybody said, see, no slippery slope. It's safe to euthanize. This data is quoted all over the world very much. Take note, people are quoting it all the time. And you're going to have to debunk it if you want to talk, talk about it. Um, I'll say a little bit more about what happened to the euthanasias there. Some of them, uh, and uh, I'm... I'm Quite, quite convicted of this. Some of them shifted into yeah, palliation. That means uh, using pain medication for something that it wasn't intended to, to be used for. Um, because the euthanasia typically happens with a cocktail of barbiturates and sedatives. Um, OK. Um, in 2008, you see we've had a kind of flat line between 2005 and 2008. The figures haven't changed much. 
But then in 2009, things start to change. And in 2010, we finally come out above the initial number. And since 2009, we've had a 15% annual increase of the number of euthanasias year by year and going. Uh, you don't need to be bright to work out that that's a pretty steep exponential curve. It's 15% of an ever-increasing amount. You know, so, so it's growing. And uh, the figures, most recent figures, this is not, uh, let's say not all the testing commissions data is back, but this is a fairly close estimate. 5,500 is going to be probably what it was in 2014. We're looking forward to the 2015 um, yearly report, which we'll be uh, getting from the government uh, probably beginning uh, next year sometime. Um, but the, the indications are that about, yeah, uh, nearly 5%, 4.5% of all deaths in the Netherlands are happening through formalized euthanasias at the moment. Just a little reminder of the, the point here, take a look, 1996, that's right there. In 1996, this man, Hendrik Reitsma, I too carry the name Hendrik Reitsma, he's my, my grandfather, I'm his namesake. He uh, was in, a, in an old people's home in, um, in Groningen, in the north of the Netherlands. Um, you see that he's wheelchair ridden, he, um, he had a partially paralyzed left leg and left arm because of a stroke he'd had some years earlier. That's my grandmother. And this is the, the whole family. And um, he, uh, in January 1996, got diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's cancer. They did a little biopsy on his cheek uh, or, or on his gum. There was a bump, sent it to the hospital. It came back, the reports were, were conclusive that he, he had non-Hodgkin's cancer. A week later, he was dead. Now, what happened in that situation? My uh, grandfather, uh, uh, at the beginning of the week, Monday, I actually visited him that week on Monday, and I, and I wondered why he was seeming so yeah, sedated, you know, so lethargic and, and non-responsive. And um, later on in that week, on Thursday, an aunt of mine was busy giving him some water. And um, one of the nurses came by, and said to her, no, no, don't do that, you're prolonging his process of dying. She said, what do you mean? And uh, that was the moment when we, as family, discovered that the old people's home was actively treating to terminate. There'd been no explicit request from him or from my grandmother. He had asked for pain treatment for his thrombotic leg. Help me toch. In, in uh, sort of the Groningen slang, please, please help me with the, with the pain he'd indicated. We, we got this information after interviews with the nurses. My uncles went and confronted, well, what, what happened af after the discovery of my aunt is that they tried to, to reverse things. He already had pneumonia because he hadn't been able to cough up the phlegm from morphine overdose for weeks, uh, and, um, and he died the next day from pneumonia. Cause of death on his death certificates, natural causes, pneumonia, etc. We tried to litigate his family unsuccessfully, um, but when my um, uncles went to confront the doctor and asked him, you know, what were you thinking? The doctor said, but he was sick, don't you get it? It was going to be three years of suffering if you have non-Hodgkin's cancer and you're 80 in his condition. Don't you get it? No, we didn't get it. Um, my father, who's a missionary, you know, he'd felt... He felt a bit bad about breaking up a very close family by being you know, half a globe away in South Africa, working amongst the Zulus all those years. When he heard that his father was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's cancer, he immediately booked a ticket to come and visit him in March. Talked to my sister, who's a physician, who said, well, the prognosis is probably three years. Um, so he said, I'm going to spend a month with my dad, just you know, while I still have the opportunity. A week later, he could rebook his ticket to come to a funeral. My granddad was a member of the Free Reform, an old bulldog, the kind of guy who during the Second World War stood on his balcony, uh, let's say, cursing his neighbors for, for helping uh, dig trenches because they were being forced to do so. Uh, you know, he was somebody who, as a matter of principle, did, did all sorts of things uh, not. You know, he, he, he was a very principle-driven man. He would never have asked to have his life terminated prematurely. And our interviews with the nurses indicated that he also did not ask to be killed. It was a physician who felt that, you know, he had a terminal condition. 
he was old, it was going to be painful, I'll spare him the ride. That was, that was bas the basic attitude. Now, it's not the way things are intended by the concepts and the laws in the Netherlands. Most Dutch people would say, wow, you know, wasn't he really more terminal than you're indicating? You know, they, they were not happy to, to hear uh, the way I indicated. But, but this is the fact of the ground. My grandmother, some years later, when she became infirm herself and needed to go to home, she went 200 kilometers away from the place where she'd lived all her life. She'd lived in a five kilometer radius her entire life. And she chose to go to a place where she knew very few people, far away from all these, her church community, the people that had loved and cared for her all her life. For one reason, she was afraid that they would prematurely knock her off in the hospital. She went to a place, a conservative, reformed, you know, old people's home where she was sure, at least there, you know, they're not going to kill me too soon. And we should not want to end up in societies where our elderly have these fears, you know. My heart was broken by that event. It was uh, something which I found a deep tragedy for her. Um, you know, um, this is not just so. This is something that really matters and it has real impact on the lives of all of us. It's dangerous for you and me when we are in, in, in for, for our loved ones. Now, I want to say two more things uh, in the data heavy part, I'm nearly done. Um, what has happened as an unexpected side effect of our euthanasia law? It's not only an incremental increase of the amount of killing that happens formally, but in the, uh, let's say, the gray shady area of the informal life ending, it has accelerated. Since 2001, we've had a, a massive increase of protocolized continuous deep sedation. Now, continuous deep sedation is a form of um, treating the, the anxiety and pain, etc., at the end of life, which can be legitimate if used carefully, if the moment of initiation is not too early. To, you know, to sedate somebody to a level where they don't experience their symptoms can be necessary in some extreme cases. But the amount that it is being used outstrips any reasonable categorization of people who might really be in a situation where nothing else will treat their pain. Continuous deep sedation means you use sedatives to put somebody basically into a comatose sleep without the intent of ever bringing them out. The words continuous deep make that clear. It's protocolized to put somebody into an unconscious state without ever planning to bring them back to consciousness. And less and less is hydration being applied in these circumstances. So you know that when you initiate, you're barreling down on the moment of death quite rapidly. Um, and I, I want to say about continuous deep sedation, I have a beef with the words. We should not protocolize with this kind of vocabulary. Symptom relief, that's a great goal. That's what palliation was always supposed to do. Having the intent to put somebody into continuous deep state is an intent which, which more and more is coming to stand loose from its close relationship to symptoms. Uh, it, it becomes the normalized way of dying. And rapidly, that's what's happening in the Netherlands. And not just in the Netherlands, but all over the world. And this is why this theme is one which I want to make personal for you. This is not somebody else's uh, uh, show. This is your backyard. This is happening in all your countries. Protocolized use of sedation in a way that might be being used as backdoor euthanasia. It's one of the possibilities. And if you look at the Dutch situation, I'm fairly sure that it is being used for a number of life-shortening uh, events, killing, to use the term full and, full and formal. Um, now, for there to, this is just a philosophic uh, uh, observation. For there to be real relief of suffering, there needs to be a sufferer. Suffering is a mind state. It's actually a conscious mind state. And um, I wonder whether intending to remove consciousness doesn't remove the ethical legitimization of doing something to alleviate suffering. Uh, so, so if our intent is to remove consciousness, if 
the physicians have to say to the family, okay, it's time to say goodbye to grandma now because she's never going to be conscious again. We've got to ask ourselves whether we're still busy with, with palliation, whether we're actually dealing with suffering because you, you need a sufferer to be treating suffering. It's a question of consciousness. There are different ways. One could use intermittent sedation, bring somebody to the surface from time to time to check whether they're doing okay. Um, but we choose to go for continuous deep sedation. You can partially sedate. That means that you titrate the midazolam, which is the, the drug of choice these days. To, you, can, you can give just enough so that somebody is partially uh, sedated. You, know, that they, uh, you can sedate down to the level where there are symptoms. And if that means that they have to be fully unconscious, so be it in those, in those exceptional cases. But on average, it's not necessary to sedate somebody into full unconsciousness to treat their symptoms. The anxiety uh, of, for example, shortness of breath disappears long before you get to full unconsciousness. The mantra, palliative sedation is not euthanasia. It does not intend to shorten life. The intent is pain relief. There can be an unintended side effect that death is hastened. It's lovely, isn't it, that kind of uh, euphemism. Um, but, but the truth is that we need to be awfully careful here. Now, into the data. In 2005, 34% of the deep sedations were with hydration. In 2010, that had dropped to 21%. In 2015, that's probably going to be less than 15%. So we are less inclined to, to do things that sustain uh, that keep people alive while we're sedating, uh, while we're more in, in inclined to, to do the sedating. Now, uh, in the 90s, morphine was still often being used in, in large doses to sedate people. That's been dropping steadily, and that's, that's a good thing. I think it's good medicine to not use morphine as a, as a means to sedate people, but it's still happening in a number of uh, Dutch cases. For example, the Ruart van Putten Hospital had a, had a sort of scandal because they'd been having a number of people dying with over, morphine overdose. Anyway, midazolam, the benzodiazepines, is, is what is being used most. Um, the moment of initiation is very important. If you put somebody into a comatose state, it, it's, it's meant to be done at the moment when somebody is, is having the anxiety and, and refractory symptoms of the real, that's a phase of dying. Uh, but it's not an exact science. And most terminal sedations are happening by GPs in home environments in a rather uncontrolled environment uh, in the Netherlands. 90% actually of all terminal sedations in the Netherlands happen at, at, at home uh, with the GP presiding over it with family and nurses saying, oh, it's time to do it, it's time to do it. We need the laws to protect the physicians, to protect the nurses. We need the laws to protect ourselves from the motive of, of, of not wanting to be burdened. France is busy legalizing terminal sedation at the moment. They're sidestepping the whole euthanasia debate. They've purged their dialogue of euthanasia. And everything in the way they're going about this debate signals to me that it's code language for the space to do life-shortening treatment. Unfortunately, the, the, the definition of what terminal sedation is is becoming very fuzzy. And so this is, this is the realm in which the knock-forward consequences of of normalizing life-ending treatment, <coughs> killing for physicians. Okay, continuous deep sedation until death. In 2001, when we legalized, 5.6% of all people dying in the Netherlands died under the circumstance of being sedated. 5.6%. In 2005, that was 8.2%. Wow. This is what I mean. There was a shift from formal euthanasia once it was legalized and there was lots of paperwork and you needed, needed second opinions, people opted for an option where you didn't need paperwork and second opinions. 2010, 12.5%. 2013, the most recent data taken from pharmacological data, 16% of all people dying in the Netherlands are being fully sedated with a, with a continuous sedation protocol. This is the um, pharmaceutical, the foundation for pharmaceutical uh, numbers. Uh, 17th April 2014 data. Here about 12,000 doses were being uh, distributed. That's up to 40,000 here. That's three times the, the increase of the use of midazolam, which is the drug of choice for this. And they've done some extra tweaking with the figures and come up with this figure of about 16% of all deaths happening with these drugs. How much matters 
The Liverpool Care Pathway, a guideline that was uh, formulated in the UK uh, for um, palliative sedation, as it's sometimes called, terminal sedation, uh, has as, a, as the maximum amount of the sedative that's allowed to be used in the first line 30 milligrams. In the Netherlands, our formal protocol reads 60 milligrams. That's twice as much. And if you look at, at the other, you know, over 24 hours, we can use up to 48, 480 uh, milligrams. In the Netherlands, the protocol allows for massive use. The, the kind of amounts that would slow down the bodily functions and organs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, a um, palliative care physician in the UK, a well-known one, looked at the data with me and, and he said, man, the dosages that you guys are using in the Netherlands really sketch you know, a much more aggressive picture than, uh, than I'm used to in our context. And people are actually using this, this amount. Just uh, This was a study from 2010. <coughs> Uh, the mean starting dose of midazolam and the cases studied for this one was, was 31 milligrams. That's already above the maximum dose of first line that the UK protocol would, would allow for. And take note, in the UK, there's actually quite a lot of opposition to the LCP. There's been a massive debate in all sorts of sectors where people are wondering whether this isn't a way to, to shorten life too, too aggressively. And uh, if you look at the, the, the protocols, you see that the Dutch situation is much further down the line. The oncology, that's the Cancer Society in the Netherlands, has indicated that at least 10% of palliative sedations is happening too early. Now, that's a, this is a national medical association that doesn't want to, f to pick a fight. Uh, if they are willing to, to make that sort of claim, you know, you have 40,000 people of the 140,000 pe people dying total in the Netherlands, 40,000 are dying with terminal sedation. And if they're saying 10% of these are being initiated too early, we're talking about 4,000 cases of, of backdoor euthanasia. And, and this is very conservative data. You know, I mean, this, if they're saying it, uh, they're, be, they're erring on the easy, on the, on the, let's say, careful side. Agnes van der Heide, one of those doing the government studies, she estimates that 17,000 cases, or 1,700 cases, sorry, where something goes wrong, that's based on research with interviewing next of king. When she says something wrong, her definition of something wrong is quite rigorous. Um, uh, she um, also, studying the data between 2001 and 2005, indicated that there was a replacement taking place. What had been done with euthanasias was now being done with palliative sedation. And now here I have a quote from somebody that I normally don't quote under any circumstance. Her name is Petra de Jong. She uh, was the director of the NFFA at the moment when she said this. The NFFA is the pro-euthanasia lobby in the Netherlands. That's the National Society for, for the Free Will End of Life. Anyway, uh, they're pro-euthanasia. And she says the following, the percentage of people dying from palliative sedation is rising disproportionately. I call this, and she quotes the government data, I call this disproportionate because it obviously is not likely that in five years the number of people qualifying for this treatment would rise so sharply, while palliative care in general has qualitatively improved so much in the meantime, i.e. all forms of other palliation that don't ask you to put somebody completely into coma. Um, it has all the signs of the fact that physicians are using palliative sedation as a backdoor for euthanasia. If she is willing to make a statement like this, uh, I'm deeply concerned in the Netherlands. Uh, we, we have a situation where legalizing euthanasia has not safeguarded us from life-ending treatment in all sorts of other realms, but has actually turbocharged it. And um, that's, uh, that's a problem. Just about the shifting perceptions. By this time, 86% of all physicians are willing to do euthanasias. That's way more than when we legalized in 2001. 33% would these days be willing to euthanize somebody simply for psychiatric reasons. That means somebody that has no physical, only existential suffering. And that goes... 27% of physicians would be willing to euthanize someone who felt they were suffering from living. We have this term in the, in the Netherlands, Lebensmut, uh, uh, being tired of life. I mean, how vague can you get as a motive for unbearable suffering to want to kill somebody? You know, somebody who tells you they're tired of life needs love. They need somebody to love them, to, to hug them. They don't need somebody to, to give them a lethal injection. We have a lot of work to do here. 29% would be willing to euthanize someone with advanced dementia. 
Now, why is that significant? It's because this is a group of people that cannot give informed consent properly. 70% of physicians in the Netherlands feel that they are being pressured to do euthanasia by patients and their next of kin. That's one of the unforeseen results of legalizing, is that everybody thinks it's their right, which makes being a physician horrible. The case in point, the, the young physician I spoke to the other day who burst out crying. It's no fun to be a physician in the Netherlands with this kind of pressure. And, and physicians indicate 90% of all physicians feel that society should have more attention for the burden that euthanasia is to them. It's the biggest stressor in, on stress scales in the business of being a physician in the Netherlands these days. That should, that should be a, a warning sign if there were any. Slippery slope or not, you know, in 2005 people were saying no slippery slope. These days, more than 50% of all Dutch physicians have done a euthanasia in the last 10 years. And somewhere between 82 and 86% are willing. Half the second opinion physicians in the Netherlands admit that they have shifted to labeling more conditions as meeting the due procedure criteria, specifically more psychological conditions. To close, a word about dying with dignity. In the first place, dignity is intrinsic and universal. Why? Because we were all made with value by a creator who intended us to live. I say this as a man of faith. But I would also argue this in a secular environment for, for the, the sheer reason that the only kind of, uh, let's say, protection in how we deal with each other is taking it as a given that every human being is of equal value. Any other position leads to racism, genocide, eugenics, bigotry, etc. We are all of equal value. As a religious person, fortunately, I have a good argument why. Because I know where that, that, that value comes from. But I would also argue it in a secular setting. Value is something that is given or attributed. It's not something you produce. Not simply owned or made. To die with dignity, therefore, is to be being loved and cared for. The implicit message being, you're worth this effort. So if you care about dying with dignity, you need to care for the people who are dying. Not think that by killing them, you somehow have produced dignity. A technique-oriented society finds it exceedingly difficult not to have remedies. We need to be willing to not look away. Don't look away. It's the hardest thing you'll ever do in your life, to have to look on while somebody else is suffering. When somebody winces, we cringe. Um, and actually, that's, thank you, that's one of those moments when the as yourself command, as formulated by our Lord, is most natural to us. When you see somebody else wince, you cringe. You feel their pain. Don't look away. Don't let it be a reason to run. Don't make it cheap. Embrace it. You are more fully human in that moment than maybe any other moment in life. I think we should be treating pain with the intent to sustain as much consciousness as possible because consciousness um, is, is that which is necessary for the playing field of meaning. You might rob somebody of the opportunity to get to know their Lord. You could rob them for eternity, you know that? By thinking that you were doing them a favor by putting them, putting them under. There are some experiences that belong to the palette of human experience which are had only in the final phase. Go and read the raft of, of research about near-death experiences. There are some deep, important experiences that are part of that. And I think that we should be willing to embrace also that part of life which, uh, which our Creator has, uh, has provided. And I just want to remind you, each and every one of you in this room is here because somebody 
typically a mother or other caregiver, somebody cared for you, not for a little while, for years when you were a weak one, when you were a baby. This is what it is to be human. See, when the goats get born in the field outside my home, we have goats in, in our yard, within the hour, the little ones are prancing around, looking for grass, they're bonking their heads against their mum, their eyes focus, etc. Humans are helpless beings for a long time, needing lots of care. It is our birthright. You see, in, in nature, it might be survival of the fittest, but, but for humans, we care for each other and we care extra for the weak. That is what it is to be human. Don't look away when confronted with the weakness of your fellow human beings. This is the time to, uh, to make the down payment on your birthright, yeah? to, to be the kind of creature you were designed to be. That is to affirm life. Thank you.